Welcome back to another episode of Keone Chats. So you're here for Laurel Barker, or formerly known as Laurel Green. So with her episode, I wanted to try something different because it's one thing to deal with different area codes, you know, Central Standard Time, Eastern Standard Time, whatever it may be. But to talk with someone, to schedule a chat with someone that's in a different country at the time of my interview with her, uh, I, you know, she is looking to move back to the States as of March of 2022. So she's, she's making progress towards that uh, as we speak. But yeah, with Laurel, that was something immediately. It's like, I, you're jumping to a whole new culture. So it's like, I wanted to know how she was able to adapt to that. And that was what made this interview fun. It's not just that I got to reconnect with someone I've known since my middle school days. Uh, what is it? Probably... If I could do math off the top of my head, probably 20 plus years ago, uh, something like that, 20, 20-ish years ago, uh, just reconnecting with her. Because, yeah, the last conversation I had with her was the last day of high school. College, we lost we lost contact, uh, and then it was random, just random, those random, you know, scrolling through Instagrams and checking out people's, like, lives, because we all do that in some extent to another, where I was like, oh, you know, I want to check in with Laurel. I want to see how she's doing. I want to kind of put some feelers out there. Not just feelers, but just I just want to see how she's doing. Because that's what kind of the glow of this conversation was. It was just the fact that I got to hear her voice again. I got to talk with her again and just get her input on some things. And, yeah, it was – she's a mother uh, of a beautiful daughter named Emma. So – uh, she was had she had a pretty short time frame, so I, I didn't want to. Well, I could have taken up more of her time. I wanted to make sure that uh, I respected her hour limit of uh, when she is needed again as a mother. So, yeah, Laurel, it's it's funny because you, you you think of someone that you've you know g- grown up with and you have that image of their head or the last image you've your experience with them in your head, and then you talk with them again. And they haven't changed at all. If anything, she has gone, I mean, okay, a little bit more rigid because oh, she's a mother, have to be protective and have to, um, also not just a mother, but just a mother and with the father being in the military, which means that he, he, he's gone for long spurts of time. So Laurel really uh, grew up very, I wouldn't say grew up, I would say Laurel figured out a great strategy for her. Uh, when it came to being a parent and also being a supportive partner to someone that's serving the country. So uh, thank you to Andrew for all of you, all that you do and everyone else that's in armed services. So thank you to everyone. Uh, and that, that, that was one thing. And then, you know, I won't go too deeply into the conversation, but it was a lot of, it was just a lot of fun just to, just to learn about what she did post post high school. So, uh, if this is your first time checking out the Kino Chats podcast show, welcome. Uh, and it, all shows are released bi weekly. So, uh, you know, don't expect when this episode comes out uh, this Monday, uh, just don't expect another episode in a couple of weeks because I'm just a one man team. So, I just want to make sure that this hobby stays a hobby. But, uh, so bi-weekly episode releases, they are on all podcast platforms. So Spotify, iTunes, uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, there you go, Google Podcasts, and then everything else. Uh, also, a video version is seen on YouTube. So you would just go to Keone Chats and follow on those audio platforms. If you're on YouTube, look up Keone Chats, subscribe, and hit the bell button to get notified when new episodes again are released. So uh, if you are watching on YouTube, then you will see on the lower right hand corner of the screen, a little lower third tag for keonikonlu.com, K-E-O-N-I-C-O-N-L-U.com. And that is my website. So if you aren't able to go to Spotify, for example, or you aren't able to go to YouTube, go to that website. And then the uh, audio and video versions of each episode are located there. Uh, audio is on my homepage. Uh, video is when you go to the video tabs in the uh, top of the screen, if I can imagine this correctly. And then uh, the drop down menu, you'll, you'll see Keone Chats. That's where that is located. So um, from there, uh, you can also check out my other uh, blog. Because uh, other, 
I am a multi-dimensional. I'm a Rubik's cube of a person. So uh, I got other things I do as well, whether it is uh, mock drafts, NFL mock drafts. So the season time is recording. The season is over. So uh, I'm still working on the mock drafts. Kind of hard because life's a little busy. So uh, yeah, mock drafts. Uh, I'm going to try and get out to the public a little bit sooner rather than later. Uh, and if no one even pays attention to it, that's fine. It's just a lot of fun. The draft class is a little weird this year just because it's not the strongest, but uh, anywho. And yeah, a DC Animated Universe review series. Uh, that is also coming up. Uh, and you know, 2022, it's the year of the superhero, whether it's DC or Marvel. So no matter what, if you're a fan of superhero movies, both animated and live action, it's going to be a great year. Great year. So before I send you off to my chat with Laurel Barker, uh, usually I ask the guest to give a little social media plug uh, at the end of their episode, but not this time around. I did. Uh, I will probably ax that out of the episode as the time between our recording of that interview to today as I'm recording this intro. Uh, Laurel had a social media snafu, so I mean, it's nothing to worry about. She got to figure it out, but she does have a new Instagram handle, so uh, it is at lb dot laurel l a u r e l b a r k e r one word uh, and so follow her on instagram i'll also put the proper tag or just properly uh, hyperlink it in the description at the bottom of the page so uh, however you are in taking this episode on whichever platform you prefer or if you are watching on youtube i hope you enjoy my chat with laurel barker Uh, sipping the cocoa uh, is <laughs> scientifically. I'm watching a lot of Bill Nye. Not really, but you know oh, he's nice. been he's been on the brain. Uh, <laughs> sipping cocoa while in a cardigan does help with sickness. It's a scientific fact. Please I believe that. Oh, <laughs> but I will quote Bill Nye. Uh, there we go. There we go. Uh, so <laughs> before I I thought that mm -hmm. I pressed record and um, I was I was mentioning with my. First ever international guest of the Keanu Chats podcast, Laurel, formerly Green, now Baker. Checks in. Barker. Barker is it Barker? You would not. You would not believe how many times that happens to me. Green was such an easy last name. <laughs> is there an R in the last name that I just completely just missed? I thought it was Baker. Yeah. Yeah. So I my my catchphrase I say a lot anytime I go anywhere. Barker like a dog. Woof, woof. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I forgot how creative you are. <laughs> uh, so I, we're, think, we're... I think my my vet is probably the only fan of it. But who giggles? <laughs> well, now that you have a you're gonna have a podcast episode to your name, you're you're gonna get blown up. You're gonna be like bark like a dog. Woof, woof. <laughs> probably butcher that too. So I apologize. So. <laughs> Uh, so uh, before, when I thought I had rec hit record, and I, when I officially mm -hmm. hit record, uh, I was talking with my first ever international guest how the first memory that we share together is at a former bowling alley called Sunset Lanes. Uh, and uh, that was, now that that bowling alley is gone, some of my memories are gone with it, but it was still just the fact that like, wow, that was a lifetime and five times five ago. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I was very sad that I didn't press record because Laurel mentioned that I was the first boy she ever held hands with. So. <laughs> Don't tell you, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my partner, if you you'll you hear this episode, I apologize. But, you know, <laughs> got to gotta hold that claim to fame where I can. <laughs> uh, so uh, again, kind of backtracking a little bit more, we started mm -hmm. talking about how checking in with family now that you're in a different country is very crucial how has now we can go back to where we were supposed to go okay we're good uh how, how has the family been these last couple of years yeah they have they have been great i have uh my my middle sister she lives out in marietta ohio which is kind of like in the middle of nowhere so covid hasn't quite touched them as much as a lot of other places which is really great and then my oldest sister, Amy, it's probably been the hardest on her because she's single living in New York City. And so Ooh. all the great things of New York City 
have gotten shut down from COVID. And so she doesn't get to enjoy where she lives. And she's just like up in her, she's almost like a princess stuck in a tower. Like she lives at the top of her building, you know, and it's just her and her cat rocket uh, running her architecture business like a boss though. But, uh, oh. and then thankfully my parents have both stayed healthy. Um, my my in-laws, they did get COVID, but they both recovered thankfully. So like in a lot of ways, COVID has not, I feel really blessed. COVID has not touched my family quite as hard or devastatingly as a lot of other people. And I feel really blessed for that. I have to ask though, you know, you're in Japan and yeah, family back in the US. Do you compare how Japan's handling versus how America's handling? Because my brother, he visited China back in like early 2000s and mm-hmm. wearing masks everywhere was a regular thing over there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So in Japan, I think we had maybe like seven cases on of COVID on base and they shut everything down. Like Ooh. they went nuts. So they're they're really strict about it. They're really careful about it, which makes you feel really safe. Like, yes, I understand wearing a mask can feel uncomfortable, but like, I just, I just had a baby. I want to keep her safe, me safe, my husband safe. Um, and so I'm actually, we're moving back to San Diego in March and yeah. And I'm actually like, <laughs> a little concerned about going back to the States because it feels really safe here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. as far as I know, so I went to, uh, California back in October. And then mm-hmm. I remember that going to Hawaii because at the airport I saw a sign like if you're going to Hawaii there's a whole lot of like requirements to be able to go there have you seen what what is uh or you what is America requiring for you coming back into the states COVID is there anything uh I actually think it's more about the the Japanese airlines regulating it than the U.S. ones. So like once I land in the U.S., they're like, Matt, you came from Japan. It's it's fine. Like at least from my understanding, I haven't traveled back to the U.S. Uh, since we moved here and we've been here for almost a year. Um, but from what I can tell, like there's just a little booth on base where you go get tested so that you can board your flight. But once once you land in the, in the U.S., mm-hmm. I haven't. But I do need to research that. So. Yeah. yeah. So um, mm-hmm. and then just I want to know about how you you, know, you met Andrew through online dating, but uh, just that whole diving to a whole nother world of the military also. What yeah. was that been like for you? Because I never took you as like someone who had an inclination or any split thought towards the military. Oh my goodness. And neither did I. And especially growing up in Portland, there's not a lot of military around. So I had zero exposure. I mean, my, my grandparents, my grandpas had both fought in World War II. Um, but that's as close as I had gotten. Uh, but yeah, I remember looking, looking at Andrew, browsing him on mutual or online dating app and saw that he was a, a naval surface warfare officer. And I said, Ooh, that sounds fancy. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and thankfully, I, I definitely, I definitely was not seeking after the military life. Um, because you know, it's a little tough. Like we have only had our boxes for s- seven months, uh, and we're about to move again. Um, but like in the last, on our way here in the previous two years, we had moved four times. Um, so you're just, I'm getting really good at moving. Oh, um, positives, <laughs> positives. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there are a lot of hard things about being a military spouse, but there's also some really great ones too. Like Andrew could in theory be retired by the time our daughter Emma hits high school, mm. which would be awesome. Wow. Uh, so there, there's a lot of things, you know, discounts on Disneyland tickets. <laughs> can't, you know, can't complain about that. You know, th- but you know, you do also have like Emma, like when Emma was born, Andrew had just gone out on patrol two weeks before, so he missed her birth, uh, the oh. birth of our first child. So there's things like that. Um, I definitely think it takes a certain kind of of person to be a military spouse. You got to be really, really independent and really up for adventure. Um, and so anytime that I hear someone's a military spouse, I like give them a little yeah, secret salute because I like, I know, I see, I see you. I know what your life is like. <laughs> <laughs> I have felt your pain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it is, it does not compare at all to the spouses of, of people who are stationed like overseas in war zones. I have, you know, I have a lot of comfort. The most dangerous thing that Andrew would do is, you know, kind of cruising around the South China Sea, but and I don't know if I can actually say that on, on 
<laughs> am, I to, am I supposed to say that? Loose lips sink ships. I learned that well. <laughs> Loose uh, lips sink <laughs> ships. Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. That was the one thing I also like. I've never again. So I've talked with Jake Island, who's also mm. someone from our past. Uh, yeah. And he has a bunch of like military like I don't know, rhymes, but just somehow Ooh. like I feel like the rhymes from the military is just kind of like smooth, just smooth as butter. <laughs> I thought something will come at me that moment, but nothing. But <laughs> <laughs> so, when you two met, was it while he was wh- where was he stationed when you? I guess I can't say swipe right because you didn't use t- Tinder. But mm-hmm. when you two matched, where was he? Where were you? And where was he? So Andrew was stationed in San Diego, uh, maybe fifty miles from where my parents live. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's the only reason that we were only in San Diego for an overlap of maybe two days and my radius was 60 miles. So he just barely was in within it, within it. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's kind of miraculous that we even found each other. Um, and I was living in Denver at the time though. I had just come to visit my family for the holidays and yeah, so it was, it was definitely a miracle. Um, and then by, oh my gosh, we, it went pretty fast. We were both, you know, it's it's different than falling in love and getting married like right when you're a freshman in college. True, and true. We we knew we had very clear ideas of what we were looking for. I actually was working um, as a freelance graphic designer for a woman, Kelly Hoffman. Shout out to her, uh, who does dating, mentoring, and coaching. And so I had to watch all the videos in order to post them on her website. Uh-huh. And so I did her class. And that's how I knew exactly what I was looking for. So I like I didn't even have to bother. I talked to a bunch of guys, but I was like, no, 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 no. And then Andrew was my one and only online date because I was like, yes, this is it. This is exactly what I'm looking for. What are some horror stories you've heard? Because you have friends that have probably done online dating because at that time, I believe it was still a like really young in its in, in, you know, implementation. Implement- implementation there you go into the society that we have right now word of the day word of the day um <laughs> so so early on like did you have any friends or that shared horror stories with you or anything that's like oh maybe you know that could happen to me sometime did you ever fantasize about oh i did not i did not fantasize that's why i was so adamantly against it because it terrified me the idea of just like having no context to who this person is and then meeting them and it it mm-hmm. made me very nervous and Andrew is a really big guy he's six three he played football at the Naval Academy like this is a big dude I am a not as large woman um and so when I went to meet up with him I was adamant about me meeting him there and so I drove myself like to Lucadia Pizza where we had our first date um, and I had my friend track me on find oh. my friend to make sure that I didn't get abducted. So I was terrified. I, and I don't know where my horror story idea came from. I don't know anybody that it's gone super badly for, but I mm. just had this concern for my safety. So <laughs> I've, uh, so my partner and I were pretty, we were going on, I think at the time of this recording, uh, it, we're like four days away from, uh 11 months so we're, we're congratulations thank you we're getting in the thick of it all um yeah. so early on we kind of knew that this was going to be the final person this is going to be someone that we're going to like mm. close the door on dating with and then open the door of like lifetime partnership with so oh, i love that i'm so happy for you <laughs> thank you that's that's <laughs> not a cartoon character of her that's that's still me so I, there's no photo of her back here <laughs> but um mm-hmm. so i told her about online dating because she also has tried online dating but she hasn't had that much time with it as i had because mm-hmm. i'm a college kid at that time and then i was like i guess going on to a year ago or something like that so it's like oh i tell her like well me going on a blind date through online it wasn't too bad i do hear some other ends of it all so when she like watches her shows and she's like Oh my God! I just saw on the you know this hall, on this movie that you know, online date was so bad that you know basically did the same thing you did, and she just goes looks at me and she's like, "Thank you for never letting me, thank you for uh, 
know, retiring me from the dating game. <laughs> like, oh, for sure. <laughs> oh, but okay. So you did the thing. You guys started talking. What was Andrew's courtship for of you, mm. you for you like? What was what was his moves? What were some things that you're like? That was good. That was good. Now that you think about it. Um. This is even on the list. I just want to know how you guys' relationship. Yeah, yeah. So he he's great at being honest about who he is, and that was really refreshing because it's such a bummer to invest so much time in a relationship and then you find out that they were just on best behavior for those four months. And mm-hmm. uh, he, so he was he's really really honest about who he was, uh, which is great because I love who he is. Um, <laughs> and we talked a ton. And this man is busy. He's like, he has a consistent habit that he wakes up at 4.30 every morning to get to the ship early. Yeah. So he's working and he's working these like eight to 10 hour days, sometimes longer. And then he also are, he's really active in our church. And so he was in charge of activities that they were having like once or twice a week. So he's running those also like, this was a busy guy and he made time. There were some days that we talked on the phone for three to four hours in in the afternoon and evening. So yeah, he made a lot of time for me. Uh, the first time that he, he called me, though, I requested it be in the morning because oh. I have a very high voice and I didn't <laughs> want to scare him off with that. So I asked him to call me right when I woke up so that my voice would be lower and he wouldn't think that I was a child. <laughs> <laughs> that is also one thing I do remember about you, that, yeah, a very a high-pitched <laughs> voice. Um, you are a little under the weather, so you know people that are – listening or watching she doesn't normally sound like this so i mean or maybe she does now i don't know this is the first time i've seen you in like i don't know 10 plus years right yeah no usually higher pitch higher speed is where i'm at so oh, okay. <laughs> thinking this is doing me a favor today <laughs> for those people who listen to their podcast podcasts on double speed it would it would not work i think i talked to someone about that oh no someone mm-hmm. was telling me about that at work and i was like uh-huh. Can, can you comprehend what they're saying? Because sometimes I may even need to like slow down because sometimes <laughs> they do pick up so fast because there is um, a podcast I listen to that kind of also helped me get into this uh, mindset or just find some sort of groove. Uh, okay. And, you know, he he's he's a fairly well-known actor, uh, but he brings on Zachary Levi uh, like three, like at least three times since I started listening to the show. And Zachary Levi just keeps going and going, going. He's so quick. I'm just like, oh my God, just slow down, slow down. <laughs> can I ask you Keon, a question, Keone of yeah. Keone Chats? Yeah, you Wait, can ask me whatever how, you like. How did you get started in all this? Because I love that you're doing this. Uh, so fans of the show, uh, they know the answer, but I'm going to share it with you because again, okay. first time I've talked to you in like 10 plus years. Uh, uh-huh. And uh, I've so, listened to a lot of your podcasts, but not not in episode number one. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> if, I think if you're not listening number one, might be a good thing no i'm kidding because uh, people were like oh episode one is actually really good and i was like are you sure because i still cannot listen to it th- to this day because oh. i still remember how everything went uh but so uh for february of 2020 um oh actually let me rewind actually uh the last two years of college i was working at this job uh this qdoba at campus and it was open late so uh, the late night crew was who I managed and uh, we would serve the intoxicated folks. Let's call it that. And uh, I started dating one of the employees there, which at that time I was like, okay. Uh, I had a hard time finding people or just like getting, getting myself out there to like meet people mm-hmm. and uh, be open. Uh, so I was like, maybe if I date someone I work with, because I'll see them at the minimum four hours to so the max eight. So at least uh-huh. we'll have that kind of chemistry. So the person I dated, uh, you know, she uh, she was a little bit younger. Uh, and then I'm giving you more details than I usually give. But, <laughs> uh, Keep going. I like it. <laughs> so she uh, she and I had a, a toxic relationship where I mm. am still uh, at that time. I was very much I didn't know how to process tough situations i didn't know how to respond properly i needed time to think it all out and even when i had time to think it all out it still wasn't a great answer so Mm -hmm. i i got really down to myself we broke up uh she also left me pretty 
shitty financial situation. Um, so uh, I went to therapy for a while and then I felt pretty good about myself. Started dating another former coworker. So the trend really just continues. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, so when her and I broke up, this was like, I don't know, maybe like a few days after Valentine's Day. Uh, and then I believe it's that week afterwards, COVID hit. So, oh man, rocking and rolling at that point. Uh, so I had my phases of like a month of like drinking and you know feeling really crappy about myself and then i had another month the following month i was like okay uh i did that I, that's fine you can't see it but there's my university of oregon diploma of journalism and communications to my right uh cool. and i was like i want to use that i want to use that i want to figure out how i can use that without having a giant uh experience resume reel coming out of college so I was like, maybe I'll go back to writing because that's how I got my start originally. And so I found out that podcasting is the next kind of generation, the next kind of technological move to tell stories. Yeah. So that's when I started to reach out to people I know and I know they're doing great things. So I was like, mm-hmm. sure, let me talk with you. Mm-hmm. And then that's I, so I, cool. progressively, my interviewing skills has gotten better and better, and better. But oh. I was like, oh, wow, that first interview. sounds pretty different since then i'm sure (laughs) yes yes also the i mean i moved a couple times actually just once and then this all this just kept upgrading like the technology the camera i'm using right now uh, my my uh, methodology was Mm -hmm. uh, again better and better so you know that's also something you and i share together because you know i photography is something that you as uh, owner of laurel green graphics do yeah. uh, graphic design mm-hmm. not so much my thing but still we're yeah. in the creative field so spinning <laughs> spinning this back to you uh mm-hmm. and then we're on that kind of creative uh tangent laurel green graphics tell me uh, how did it what was that spark moment what was that time where you're like okay because i had my my i feel shitty moment i'm gonna use my degree what was your moment where you're like i want to figure out a way to get some practice with the thing i got went to school for Mm -hmm. yeah so i i think it all started for me in high school i was asked to volunteer on this council of like teenagers and we helped organize dances at our church um and i was like i want to be the poster girl i'm gonna make all the posters for the dances and when I look back now, my, my posters are atrocious. They're awful. But I was like, this is my start. This is how I get into graphic design. This is it for me. And so my dad is so sweet. He like, I, I got accepted to BYU in Provo, Utah. And my dad called up the graphic design uh, program to make sure that he like sent me off with all the tools and things that I would need to succeed, which is exactly who my dad is. It's super sweet. Um, and then I got there, I was taking the prerequisites because you have to apply with a portfolio. And I sat down with the department head and I did not like him. Oh no. And I was like, I don't, I don't care how badly I want to be a graphic designer. I can't, I don't want to study under you for the next three years. So I didn't, uh, I didn't end up even applying. Uh, I went to industrial design instead, uh, which is, a little sim like still the same creativity uh and and drawing and things like that but more into products and design rather than graphics um i did that for a summer and then applied and decided like you know what this is just it sapped all my creativity and i didn't get in so there's that also what Um, yeah (laughs) but it was it was nice kind of like you know, when like someone breaks up with you and you're like, well, I was going to break up with you too. Like, it's, you know, it's, <laughs> that's kind of what happened to my heart with industrial design. Um, and so then in the same building though, or a similar building, there was this program called technology and engineering education. They mm-hmm. called it T and T E E. And everyone thought that it was like a golfing club. No, no, no. It's a major. It's a, it's a real major. Um, or you know and, kids are like because like tee hee hee. <laughs> so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's like tucked away in this building that sometimes gets left off the campus map like it was really Jesus. out in the middle of nowhere and there was no application process though they would take it, it was open enrollment 
Daily Chats is proudly sponsored by Adelsheim Vineyards. Adelsheim is a winery based in the Pacific Northwest since 1971. Founders David and Ginny Adelsheim opened up the winery with the goal to create world-class wine in the Shehalem Mountains. Adelsheim has worked with companies like Growing Gardens, One Barrel, the Portland Trailblazers, and now the Keone Chats podcast show. At that just I'm ecstatic for this. This is so this is so much fun just to uh, just record this plug because uh, the Pacific Northwest is known for being wine country and for one of their pillars to show the support in this way. Uh, it just makes me so happy. So uh, if you would like to go to Adelsheim.com, A-D-E-L-S-H-E-I-M.com, shop around, create a cart, put in some Chardonnay, put in some Rosé put in some uh, Pinot Noirs, and then before you check out, use the discount code GRANDCREW, that's G-R-A-N-D-C-R-U, for 20% off your total purchase. That is huge. Thank you so much to Adelsheim for providing this way for the fans of the Keone Chats podcast show to try some of the wine, because why, why not? I That was a great dad joke, I feel, so... Um, yeah, you must be 21 years and over to purchase any alcohol from Adelsheim. But if you'd like to use a code for a merchandise, which they do have as an option, that's totally good. Uh, so, uh, yeah, everyone, please enjoy responsibly. And so I went and I got a tour around the studio and it was like a playground it was Ooh. so fun they had a recording studio and a little recording booth for sound they had all these beautiful brand new mac computers um they had their own auditorium in there for their classes uh they had an entire woods lab for woodworking and an entire metals and plastics lab for that and then you also take classes in robotics and coding and it was it so it covered everything graphic design photography robotics woodworking welding everything hmm. and then it also gave you a degree to teach so that you could teach all those subjects at a middle school or high school level oh. um you could teach any of them at middle school level but you had to specialize in order to teach at a high school level and so i okay. specialized in multimedia um and then i did a minor in graphic design because none of those classes were touched by that graphic design department <laughs> that, I, that I just didn't get along with. Um, and I loved that. So I, I didn't want to be a teacher. I wanted to be everything during my life. I dreamed of being a firefighter and a policewoman and a vet and all the things I never wanted to teach. Um, and I actually remember, this is just since you interviewed so many people from our past, Anna Stone, yeah, if you remember yeah, her, yeah. Um, she and I used to play together in elementary school and she always wanted to play school. And mm. I, every time I was like, you can be the teacher. I have no desire. Like I'll do all your made up homework assignments. I don't care. I just don't <laughs> want to be a teacher. Um, so my, my, I did one semester in this TEE program and then they had an opportunity to do a study abroad in the Dominican Republic where you would teach uh, technology at this school mm -hmm. um, for like, I think it was six weeks. Um, so I was brand new in the program, so I hardly knew anything. And I was teaching, I got assigned to teach the advanced technology course, like to the older kids in Spanish. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Wait yeah. a minute. Wait so, a minute. <laughs> like, thankfully, thankfully, we had a translator there who could help because one of okay. my co-teachers does not speak a lick of Spanish, bless his heart. Um, but I, I spoke enough. Like I was dangerous enough. I took IB high, sure. uh, yeah. high school Spanish five or whatever it is. Uh, so I was able to break that out. And my students totally made fun of me every now and then for like, that's not how you say that, senorita verde. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but we had, I had a blast and I, that was my moment where I was like, okay, I, I would love to teach. And it's not because mm. I love teaching and being a teacher. It's because I love the relationships you can build with students to help inspire them and believe in themselves and who they are. These are kids in, the first day we arrived in the Dominican Republic, uh, these students gave us a tour of their home. I'm talking literally like like metal sheets for the walls. They're, they have maybe one mattress on the ground on dirt. 
that their whole family shares and they maybe have electricity and running water if they're lucky but they also wear these like fancy clothes and all have cell phones it was it was a really bizarre it was really bizarre so I never would have known what their situation was like at home if they hadn't shown us their home yeah uh, so I just loved I loved inspiring these students of like you are smart you can do things and you can get out of here and I I they all wanted to friend us on Facebook it was super cute and so I've watched them now years later and they're doing incredible things it is so cool and I love that I got to inspire a piece of that is there what was you know let's say that like the first like handful of months was there mm-hmm. any I don't know if you remember the students or just maybe what the experiment was do you remember a moment where you're just like wow I I kind of blew your expectations of the environment because I've seen, I saw a movie, I can't remember the name of it, where uh, this, it, it did kind of revolve around the Dominican Republic, kind of South America, yeah. where uh, mm-hmm. I remember, I can remember bits and pieces, honestly, cannot remember the name, but where mm-hmm. it was the invention of uh, a water drain system. Um, oh, are you talking about the boy who harnessed the wind? That's the Africa? one. That's the one. Yeah. Yes. That's an awesome story. Was there anything like hi? This is my this is my husband and my cute our cute baby. Hello, hello, hello. great to meet you. Hi, oh, Hi, I'm sorry, Andrew. I have my AirPods in. So That's okay. Actually... You know what? Big funny. He just brought me a biscuit. There you this go. This is why you marry a man from the south. Ah, uh, okay, okay. North Carolina. <laughs> Be- best biscuits across the whole country. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely, hands down. Uh, so yeah, no, going but- going back to the movie. Um, mm-hmm. was there anything yeah. like that where you're just like, wow, this is way above what I thought that was going to be capable of them be able to do, or is this you just kind of can't went in there with a blank slate? Yeah, I just um. Well, and I think at at that very beginning, too, I was so nervous about my teaching and um, because that was just that was like my first teaching experience. Right. When I got hired on after I graduated to teach high school full time for three solid months, my legs would shake every time I was in front of my classroom for three months, every single Monday through Friday for three months, my legs would shake. Um, so I think a lot of like my beginning was just me panicking, like, I really hope I repeat this. But the moments that I remember are at the end of the year, like students who would come back and like there was this this one student who um she had noticed I always had music playing in my classroom. I loved like making playlists for them to just hang out when they're on Photoshop and stuff like that. And there was a student at the end of the year, she came and she gave me a Brandon Flowers CD. Oh, because man. the killers are my favorite band and like yeah. things like that and i'm like you know that i'm not just your teacher that i'm a human like, it just it's <laughs> like just those relationships those relationships are my favorite part of yeah. teaching um there was a kid who attempted suicide while he was taking one of my classes um and he ended up like for the last year like, he would come and play guitar in my room every day at lunch because he just like wanted someplace to go and like totally, totally turned around his life. And oh. it's like thing, things like that. And like, I remember going to his house and trying to like talk with his parent to let him know like, hey, he has people who care about him. We want to help. And just all these incredible experiences. There are um, people that I, I taught your book also. And um, just like, man, that's some serious responsibility. Like it's, it's just so cool to see where they are in my little classroom and then where they go out to be in the world. There was this one student, I'll give a shout out to her, Gina Alfred. She's great. Um, And every day I was working so hard as a first year teacher. And then all the years after that, that she would come and be like, Miss Green, have you eaten your lunch yet today? And I'd say, (laughs) no, Gina, I have not. And she would say, you need to stop what you're doing and you need to eat your lunch. (laughs) I love these kids and and I loved teaching high school that was my favorite age and so I'm really glad I I uh I also need to give a shout out to Alex Golding because he is uh I don't know that either of them will ever listen to this podcast not and not because of you because of me um (laughs) but (laughs) um but those were two that that really really helped me out in my teaching they took really good care of me it was super sweet um 
And so I taught for three years. Uh, and this was in, a, in Winchester, Virginia. You can look up the school, John Hanley High School. It is one of, it's one of the top 50 most beautiful schools in the United States. It's gorgeous. Um, and I actually was, when I was applying for the job, I was about to turn them down. And my mom said, hey, have you seen what the school looks like? And I said, no, because that wouldn't matter. All schools are just big blocks. She's like, I think you should probably Google it. And I looked and it is, it's the perfect place to teach photography because oh. there are so many beautiful places to take pictures on campus. Gosh. It was so fun. Mm -hmm. So out of these courses, because I also, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about that transition from, you know, that experience of teaching Dominican Republic to teaching back in the States, because mm -hmm. a lot of people, mm -hmm. I, for some reason, I was just thinking like, oh, you're transitioning to, from people that don't have a whole lot that have to fight mm -hmm. scrap and still stay humble mm -hmm. to, yeah. you know, the States where sometimes people are a little too, too privileged. But out of these mm -hmm. courses that you taught, uh, imaging technology, video and media technology, geospatial studies, and handling your book, I, I guess these four, mm -hmm. sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. What was the most difficult one to, you know, kind of send a message from your brain to the -hmm. students and for them to comprehend? Uh, geospatial studies was super hard because it's not my, it's not my forte. And it was a call a concurrent college course. They got college credit for it um and so that was really that was really tough because it's just not really my field but they knew exactly what they were doing because I'm a, a first-time teacher right when they're interviewing me I was living in Florida working for Disney at the time when I had my interview from my little apartment I'm gonna um, ask about that and next. They, yeah <laughs> they like casually slide it in the interview they're like oh there also may be a chance that the yearbook teaching position is open. Is that a class that you would consider teaching? And me, like bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, straight out of college, I'm like, oh, sure, that sounds fun. Mm -mm. Holy smokes. <laughs> it, like, nope, none of the other teachers wanted to take it because it is so time-consuming and it's yeah. so, it's so tough. But we made it through. My yearbook staff was awesome. They were, they were really great. You can curse Megan on this. Gaynor, I don't, I, I don't know if you Golden, can. I don't know if you Nicole can. Bar if, if you have that in your system to curse, but if you I need to, I didn't think so. <laughs> I just want to give you the green light. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> uh, okay, so you did leave a little nugget in there that you know. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is kind of help me out with the timelining. So, uh, mm -hmm. jumping being an intern at Walt Disney, a this fits you like a T <laughs> just <Thank you. laughs> everything I know about you, all the experiences I've had with you working with, I was gonna say the golden arches, but that's McDonald's, but uh, working with the, the castle and Walt Disney, what yeah. was that, you know, uh, application process like, what were you thinking? Mm -hmm. Cause I remember in college one time I applied for the NFL network and I was like, I'm not going to get it, but I was like, why not? I have nothing else to do. But I was still like, oh, this is exciting. How were you yeah. doing that application process? Oh yeah, I was I was over the moon because I love Disney like crazy. Uh, I applied twice. The first time, uh, I had the attitude of princess or bust. Oh, and wow. yeah, and that <laughs> like go figure. You have to have grace and poise to be a princess, mm -hmm. and I have neither of those things. So I took, I had an extra credit at BYU one semester that I took about an intro to ballet course to try to attain princess-like grace and poise. Mm. It backfired. I was the worst person in my class. The teacher literally would just stand next to me some days and be like, no, that is, that is wrong. Oh. Stop, stop doing that. Like it was, it was almost embarrassing because I'm an athlete. I don't, I don't know how to dance. <laughs> um so I took my ballet course I got an audition up in Salt Lake City is the one day I ever skipped a course in college I skipped a day of class I drove to Salt Lake City I had my princess audition um and they tell you at the end if you can stay or go and they're like yeah you, you can go <laughs> so so I was like super bummed but uh so then my senior year because in order to do the college program uh the Disney college program you have to be either enrolled at a university or just graduated so my mm -hmm. senior year uh I applied again and I said I will take whatever they can give me I don't care what it is so they assigned me uh because if you think about your days at Disney like 
what you know there's a small percentage that you're actually riding rides and then there is a very large percentage of your day that is eating snacks mm -hmm. so there is a lot of of cast members who are in charge of providing the disney snacks and so they gave they assigned me quick quick food service and beverage um so like fast food essentially in the park they didn't tell me where or anything like that and i was like you know what i would i'll scrub disney toilets if i have to i don't <laughs> care i just want to go um so i uh once i arrived in florida they tell you on your on your first day what your position is and they assigned me to the cone shop scooping ice cream on main street in the magic Ooh. kingdom and i was thrilled because i had a i had a roommate who had to like push one of those carts and it's florida in the summertime it's hot it's miserable i'm in the nice air conditioning with all the ice cream and it was it was so fun and you get to go to the parks for free anytime you want to um, because we were cast members, we got early access to ride uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves Mine Train for the first time before any of the guests could. Like, cool things like that. It was so much fun. <laughs> I made no money, but I did not care. <laughs> I, I didn't know you would. Um, that's, yeah, you're, you're kind of living the dream at that point that you had since you were a kid of like, yeah. I'm, I'm here. I am, I'm wrapping the brand. It might not be the best, like, payout at the end of it or no payout mm -hmm. at all but you have all those memories locked in inside your head forever yeah. and ever yeah which of the disney characters were you most excited to meet i'm not like actually meeting but like cosplay meet because there were a whole bunch of actors that like you know mm -hmm. like aladdin or whatnot mm -hmm. was there anyone you're just like i oh my god i need to meet this person or this character at the time, Frozen had just come out, so you can only imagine what the line was like in order to meet them. And so there's one day that the park was closing, and there happened to be like maybe three or four people in line. And so me and my friends went, and I was like, ah, I get to meet Anna and Elsa, and I didn't have to wait three hours to do it. <laughs> that was, but I do, I love Snow White because, because of my voice and my short, dark hair. That's the one that people tell me the most often that I look like. Mm -hmm. um and there were times my family had come to visit me while I was working at Disney and I think we were at like Universal Studios or something and I happened to wear this red bow from my Snow White costume that was from high school um and this little girl like tugs on her mom it's like mom that is Snow White Snow White <laughs> is standing right next to us and she's like freaking out and like not even the right part girl but i like it made my it made my life like getting that oh. that comparison like mom it's so white so uh in my research process there is a lot of deep diving to people's social media so i did see that in 2013 you did get hired to play snow white in um for a little girl's party maybe i don't know uh, the full uh -huh. background of it but uh mm -hmm. this is i assume before you were an intern at walt disney or afterwards this would have been before before yeah um so. yeah and that it was it was for my niece's birthday party my sister called ah. me up and was like hey if i pay for your flight will you come be snow white at lorelei's <laughs> birthday tea party and i mm -hmm. said of course i will so i packed up my snow white princess dress and we were on our way to reno <laughs> <laughs> so um do you ever in that like kind of comparing the two moments of like you playing mm -hmm. Snow White for your nieces and then this this girl were you ever just like now 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 think about it, are you ever like maybe I should have done the well you know cosplay or you know be mm -hmm. jump into that role or make a little bit harder push because um, I used to work at Nike uh, I worked at the Nike in downtown Portland so mm -hmm. there are a lot of times where I was like this is awesome I'm ripping a like a homemade brand. It's yeah. big also. Uh, and then they say, like, if you want to continue on with the career, you're like leaving the store, you have to like work your ass off. So mm -hmm. I I had a few attempts, but I never really followed through just because like it didn't really fit where I want to go anymore. So mm -hmm. when you look back, you know, you got that experience of playing Snow White at your, nie your nieces and then the, mm -hmm. the girl confusing you for Snow White and then you get to be around do you ever mm -hmm. just think oh, you know what maybe i should have tried a little harder to stay with disney or are you like i'm good with this chapter ending yeah i i think i was okay with the ending especially because my heartbreak moment where i was at that birthday party and my niece comes up to me and says can you be lola again now that's what she calls me is lola and i was oh. like oh 
Okay, my Snow White days are done. Oh. <laughs> but I still have that dress somewhere. Oh, there you go. There you go. Well, I mean, you can use that for Emma, you know. When uh -huh. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, so that when you like, again, kind of like backtracking a little bit, but going from being at Walt Disney and then opening up with Laurel Green Graphics, mm -hmm. did you do you ever like kind of doodle around and be like, I wonder if I like redo Snow White's logo with this because I see so many things on social media of like. Uh -huh. Oh, I redid, uh, let's say, Iron Man's suit or something like that, or I redid this or that. Um, mm -hmm. Back then, did you ever kind of mess around with the uh, Walt Disney's and the characters and see how, like, how it could look a little bit updated, a little bit better? Uh, I never did anything with their design because I love, I love Disney's design. But I did practice. Uh, each princess has a certain signature, like an autograph. And I, there were some times that I would practice the Snow White autograph just in case any little kid ever was convinced that it was a real deal and needed mm -hmm. an autograph that it would look like the real thing. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. You're really prepared. Mm -hmm. You're really prepared. <laughs> <laughs> it's all part of the magic, right? It, it really is. It really is. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you see yourself pursuing uh, maybe continuing to grow Laurel Green Graphics or how, how do you think, what do you think about Because you did mention your, your older sister uh, mm -hmm. owns a business as well. So there, yeah. that's, a, that's an avenue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amy Green Design in New York City. She's an architect and she does awesome work. Um, so I... I was diagnosed with ADD when I was a junior in high school and I went on this wonderful medication that like turned my life around. I had thought, I had thought for so long that I was a stupid kid. Like, why can't I do these things that everyone else can? Um, and this medication just like totally turned that around for me because like I had the smarts and I was willing to work hard. I just like couldn't focus. Uh, so I was on that medication for about 10 years and then you can't be on it when you're trying to get pregnant. Mm. And we ended up trying for like almost a year and a half to get pregnant with Emma. So that was a long time that I was off my, and after being on a medication for 10 years, like going cold turkey like that was really hard. Uh, so I've had a really hard time working since then. Now that I've been off of it for about two and a half years, I'm finally starting to work back up to being able to be productive in work like I can do normal house task things but like sitting down to work and be creative is a very different kind of focus for me so oh. that was kind of my sacrifice was mm. I wanted to be a mom and so I was willing to let go of my company and and this is this is what I want to be doing so I am a I think I've heard someone call it like a non-paid full-time mom or something like this but I'm, I'm a stay-at-home mom and I'm okay with saying that um and I I absolutely love it and I think especially with Andrew being military he is gone so much of the time I would have a really hard time with where my focus and my brain is at right now uh trying to work even part-time while being a mom to Emma when he because he is he's gone a lot and he works really long days okay so the ADD I actually I never knew about this knew this about you mm -hmm. uh yeah what do you remember kind of early on sign sites signs signs that's the word mm -hmm. um like were you just uh like focusing on a test for example and then you just kind of scan the whole room and then you just find yourself doing that what were some things that mm -hmm. uh when you are officially diagnosed that you're just like oh mm -hmm. that, that makes sense that moment does make yeah. sense now mm -hmm. yeah there was I was never able to finish the practice SAT test or the practice ACT test I know but, you know, there's a lot of people that that happens for. So it's not like that on its own was like, oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, it, Mr. Kabrowski's like IB history class, that mm -hmm. class killed me. And I like I would just read and it was a lot of reading assignments and I would read through. I would even read it to my dog so that it was like processing better. And I still could not tell you what I had just read because my like my brain just like couldn't grasp onto it um so like test was a big one like attention span reading retention was another big one I just had like a lot of a lot of energy that went a lot of places and I couldn't I couldn't point it in a direction um I get really passionate about things and I totally deep dive and then two months later I'm like Meh, hmm. I'm over it um I what are some other things 
Um, I cannot prioritize. Uh, so like you give me a little list, and you know, like, there's even like that little squares activity where it's like, oh, these are the things that need to get done soon. These are the things that are important. And you like make the little matrix square. Like I can't, I don't have the capability to do it. It like is so, it's so hard for me. Um, things, things like that. I don't know. Uh, and my mom, it's so funny. My mom told when I came to her and asked her like, Hey, I don't know what's going on, but I'm really struggling and it's making me feel really dumb. And I want, I want to be in these advanced classes because I want to get into a good college. So like what, what is going on? What do I need to do? Because I was working so hard. I was working so hard and all my friends would want to hang out because they had finished their homework hours ago. And I'm like still there struggling with the first problem. And my mom was like, oh yeah, I'm pretty sure you have ADD and I'm pretty sure you've always had it because she had it as a kid. And then she saw all the signs of it when I was little. Uh, and I was like, why didn't you ever tell me? She's like, <laughs> because I didn't want you to lean on it like a crutch. Like mm -hmm. I wanted you to find your own ways of coping. And so that did, that helped me for what, 17 years. Um, but I just got to a point where I wanted to achieve more than I was able to do on my own. And so that medication helped me to do that. And it was, it was wonderful. So now that you're a mother and mm -hmm. I, you know, obviously when you talk about it, you're like, why oh, I should have known about this, but her reasoning doesn't make sense. Now that you're mm -hmm. a mother, would you do the same thing if Emma came to you or what would you have oh, done? Oh, shoot. <laughs> I, you know, I've always been really grateful that that's what my mom did. So I think I would, and it depends on what her issue is, true, you know, true. but, um, cause she is definitely more like Andrew, <laughs> who is very focused and attentive. I love mm -hmm. that about him. Uh, so, you know, but yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. I like, and I have to think about these things now because I'm a parent. Yeah. So. yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, I, okay. So when I found out that your mother and then, uh, you did this great Instagram series post of, you know, the baby's mm -hmm. progression. In oh, yeah. Um, uh -huh. The first thing I thought was like, she is, again, going back to like all our experiences together in high school, middle school, mm -hmm. uh, I was like, that really fits her. Like, as far as like, you know, she has a very kind nature, uh, mm -hmm. very uh, soft spoken, also maybe a little high pitch spoken, but still mm -hmm. very like sweet and tender. Um mm -hmm obviously Emma's too young for you to turn on hard hard mom or just like very strict mom angry mom mm -hmm. have you and Andrew had that conversation about like when she gets in trouble who's gonna be a good cop who's gonna be a bad cop obviously this episode will live mm -hmm. on forever so. <laughs> <laughs> Emma, 18 when... year old Emma know that I love you <laughs> there you go there you go yeah like that kind of division because you know Andrew from the very short interaction we had he's like very mm -hmm. very kind guy you two mm -hmm. are a very kind person it's like who's going to be the, mm -hmm. the tough person in the, in, when those moments come Andrew is great at keeping his cool I definitely get more hot-headed um there have been some times where I'm sitting with Emma and Blue our dog does something then I'm like like Blue, leave it or something like that and it startles Emma like because I she doesn't hear that tone from me very oh. often and I'm like oh I hope I never I hope I never <laughs> use that on you but like fast forward 18 months from now mama Laurel is gonna lose her cool that's for sure but and it's hard because Andrew's so much better at those situations but Andrew deploys and Andrew is gone and so I need to be able to learn to step up and be the kind of I need to be both parents when he's gone and that will mean learning to curb my frustrations with a naughty toddler. Mm. But if she's like Andrew, then she's not going to be that naughty. So, right. <laughs> he was All a right. really good kid. He was a super good kid. <laughs> <laughs> um, your support system, like when he does, if he has gone for long extended periods of time, uh, it's across country lines. Have you started developing a support system for yourself there in Japan? I love the spouses here. They are awesome. Um, and we like go on adventures to shrines and waterfalls and food places. And that has been so much fun. I'm actually really disappointed to be leaving that in March. Uh, but we'll be back in San Diego. And that is where my parents are. And Andrew will be gone for like up to a year. So it'll be a really good time to be able to have family around to help. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. How first off like how do you keep yourself like composed because i've seen a lot of movies where you know the 
I don't uh, a military movies. I don't watch too much, but like I've seen a handful. Mm-hmm. But it's just like the idea of like someone being gone that you love and you would die for just being gone for mm-hmm. a year. You ha- granted, you know, you have these Zoom chats, you have these other video chats, and whatnot. How mm-hmm. how do you like? What are you doing for yourself to get yourself ready for that time? Um, I I've made it a rule. Uh, that when Andrew comes home, like I, I just enjoy time with him. Like when Andrew's home, it's just our little family spending time. So things like cleaning floors, washing dishes, things like that. Um, I just leave it aside until Andrew is at work because I just try to soak up as much time with him as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. Um, and I send him pictures of Emma every single day when he's gone, uh, because they grow up so fast, especially at this age for him to be gone for a year. She's going to be so different when he comes back. Um, and I want to make sure, uh, I've gotten a lot of really good advice from military moms about how to make sure that your child recognizes their dad when they come home from a deployment. So like the first time that when Andrew was gone, when Emma was born, uh, I had him record bedtime stories and I would play his voice for her every night so that she knew what his voice sounded like. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she was three months old. She didn't really care about the book part, but just so that she could get to know his voice and recognize it when he came home, things, things like that. Okay. I think it's just as hard on Andrew to be away from us as it is for him to be away from me. Yeah. Now for, Mm -hmm. for you, because that, that could be a dark, a, a pretty big hole if they would kind of get caught up in the fact that he, the days might seem longer and uh, it might seem endless. For, for you, do you, are you like trying, are you playing to like maybe exercise more, be in the sun a little more, like reintroduce mm-hmm. yourself to California and the, the mm-hmm. United States of America? Uh, what, what are you thinking you're going to do to kind of help yourself stay mentally Mm-hmm. you know uh not like distracted but just mentally uh mm-hmm. aware that it's there the the missingness but i'm going to continue on with my life mm-hmm. yeah honest honestly don't get me wrong i love i love andrew being around um i love my husband so much i get so much done when he's gone oh. it's crazy <laughs> it's crazy um so things like unpacking our house and like reorganizing systems things like that um, working out, uh, going on like adventures to go hiking. When we lived in San Diego before, I went, I took our big dog hiking all the time and to mm-hmm. dog beaches and stuff like that. Um, and I also spent a lot of time up with my parents, which they're going to love now that there's a grandbaby in the picture. That's true. So That's I true. think, yeah. And every Tuesday, me and my mom would meet up somewhere in San Diego, usually at Balboa Park, which will be so fun now that I have Emma to show her all the little museums and things like that. And so. So there are some things that I get a little excited about when he's gone because I do. I get, I'm so productive when he's gone, but I would rather have him home. <laughs> so, uh, when uh, knowing you through high school and college, mm-hmm. I mean college, we didn't really talk too much. Mm-hmm. But uh, in high school, I never really got to meet, interact with Laurel Green. Laurel at the great time, Laurel Green, in a relationship. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. how how do you keep your independence? Because, I mean, mm. obviously, Andrew's going to be gone. That's kind of like out of your power to keep him there. But because mm-hmm. this is a conversation I have with my partner all the time. It's like she wants to make sure that we'll be a well, we're team, but mm-hmm. she also wants to make sure we keep our independence. How do you do that? Yeah. yeah. Honest, uh, thankfully, the military does it for me. Oh, yeah. So yes. Andrew, Andrew has to be, when we were first dating and first married, he was on a ship that had something called three section duty, where that means that every third day, he had to stay on the ship for 24 hours. Mm-hmm. Um, so I and I got kind of used to that. And so actually, oh. now that he's here, he's in six section duty. Oh. I'm like, after like, at first, after about three or four days, I was like, I'm for you to stay on the ship a little bit longer so I can get some things done <laughs> so just, the military just naturally makes me miss my husband all the time which uh. is, it's been really good for us so I whether I want to be independent or not I have to be in order to keep up and I knew when we were dating I like inter- I went out to lunch with us some spouses that were military spouses one that they had stayed in the military and one that they had gotten out mm. and so I it, like interviewed them before I said yes right uh. Um, to make sure that I had what it takes and that I was, because I was signing up, I was signing up 
essentially, you know, for the mil- I was essentially marrying the military as well mm-hmm. as Andrew. Uh, and so that was a really important part of, because I did not want to get married and then a year in say like, sorry, you have to quit your career because it's hard for me. Like I wanted to make sure that I knew what I was getting into and that I didn't have to ask him to do that. I never took you as someone that would propose that kind of ultimatum or someone that would kind of run from a hard situation. So that, that does, I mean, that's, I'm one of those, after like all these interviews, you're going to be uh, episode 68. So after mm-hmm. 67 interviews, cause I did an inter- episode with myself. Um, that is one thing I'm starting to like, you know, get to like know about myself. It's like, I hear someone mm-hmm. like kind of persevering, kind of making yourself like a strong person. I'm just like, let's go. I'm getting psyched <laughs> for you. Yes. <laughs> I, I will say though, but like, you know, cause I, I feel a little bit mean about my comment that I made about like, this is too hard. We got to get out of the military because I really haven't been in a super hard situation yet. Like his yes. underways are usually a max of two weeks. And then he had the deployment for about three months um, when our daughter was born. But other like, that's the longest time that we've been apart is those mm-hmm. like three months. Uh, so this next deployment is going to be a lot longer. And so I will have a much more realistic understanding of what it's like um, because it is, it's hard. It's hard on both parents, you know, the active duty member and the spouse at home to have that spouse miss all the birthdays and the baptisms mm-hmm. and the soccer games and the music concerts. And so we're just kind of taking it one step at a time of whether we can handle this or not. But so far, five stars. It's been great. Five stars. <laughs> <laughs> so one of, the, one of the last things I want to ask you is that, uh, in in or I think maybe one or two years post high school, one of mm-hmm. our our friends, more yours than mine, Alex John Pello, who was mm-hmm. in the military, uh, and yeah. you know he, he passed away. It's weird, you know. It's it's kind of you're the first yeah. person I'm talking with him about because uh, after his passing, uh, I did have so I'm a brother, and I went to the funeral and funeral service mm-hmm. and. Yeah. I remember walking in and uh, going to like this room to the right where I didn't really, I wasn't even supposed to be there because it's like all of John's closest friends and they're like mm-hmm. a little bit more intimate kind of service for him. I was like, Oh crap, I'm in the wrong room. So <laughs> excuse me. I uh, went out to the main, the main area. And then I just remember the one thing that really like triggered me and just kind of brought me to tears was just that I'm a brother hearing John's brothers talk about him. Um, I don't mean to put a, a, a sour kind of like damper on the mood because it is amazing getting to talk to you again, but that's something is that, how do you, how do you work with that thought of like, you know, this, this, this could happen. Yeah. So uh, on our, on our very first date, uh, Andrew and I, we like had our pizza and ice cream walk on the beach. And then I was in town to see my parents. So I was like, hey, do you want to come over and hang out with me and my parents? Like, if you want to, if you want to keep seeing me, he's like, yeah, sure. So we watched this movie Dunkirk with them. I don't know if you, it's a military yeah. film about yeah. D-Day. Um, and I remember like leaning over him and asking like, are you, are you afraid of drowning with your, like what your career is? And he's like, no, my boat floats. <laughs> I was like, all right, that's, that's the kind of confidence that I need that, he just he does a lot of reassuring um and Mm. I just I just have to have the faith that that we're gonna get taken care of but yeah it is it's a very real concern um and I do I do often think of like I need to be able to if something happens to our family like I need to be able to provide for our kids if something were to happen to Andrew Mm -hmm. um but thankfully Thankfully, like the, the Navy is a very different, uh, you know, deployment situation than, than the military like John Pelham was in. And so I'm, I'm really grateful for that because I can't imagine the kind of stress that that would put on a family. Yeah. Yeah. And then I, yeah, I just remember that was so hard, but the kind of the, the flip side was just like, I got to see people I haven't seen in like at that time, like mm-hmm. probably like 12 years. No, mm-hmm. no, two years, two years, two years, two, three years, I think. Yeah. So it's like, it's sad, but also like I got to see Hunter Lacaden. The dude looked like mm. trim as all heck because he's been in like yeah. from what I remember his story was like he was in Georgia like, in the heat and, and doing all this. So mm-hmm. um every, you know, I don't know if you saw like have seen or driven on Walker going into 
coming yeah. off uh, 216, going into Walker. You see, mm-hmm. he he has a road dedicated to. There's a road dedicated to him now. Um, yeah. I, yeah. You know, I and just, I always every time I hear the scripture, I always think of John Paul. The scripture it goes like, uh, there there has to no greater love than this that a man lay down his life for his friends. And I think of John Paul every time. Mm-hmm. Um, that what the, the reason that he was there and the work that he was a part of, like there's there's no better definition of of heroism. And I I'm really grateful. I've uh, his family is so sweet, and I love the way that they've kept his memory alive because it is it's so inspiring the sacrifice mm-hmm. that he made. I always think about the last little bit of conversations I've had with him because we played football together, and at that time, I haven't talked about this with Anna, where like. Uh, if I could redo high school again, there's like the one thing I would redo is just like, I would be less in my head and more like in the moment. Cause at the time mm-hmm. I was like, Anna, like I've known her since she was a kid. Like we, we have a lot of like high, like family ties together. But like, once you got to high school, I was like, Oh, that's, that's Anna. She's, she's a good looking woman. And it's like, why am I so nervous to talk to her? Or why am I, I talk to her? I'll just come out jumbly. Uh, mm-hmm. Another thing I would have redone is just like my interactions with Alex. Cause we played football together and like, we actually mm-hmm. met before he went to sunset and um, I, yeah, if I, if I could, I would have redone my interactions with him because he's, yeah, he's from what I saw you two interacting. It was, mm-hmm. it was very much like the true spark of a good friendship right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we were, we were closer friends in middle school, not as much in high school, but I, I do. I have some really great memories with him in middle school. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is one thing we could share about John uh, real, real quick? And then there's a little thing I'd like to do at the end with you, but as we kind of wrap up the interview, well, what, what is uh, one thing about John that you remember and laugh about to this day? Um, uh, I have these pictures from my, like my very first cell phone that I had got in the seventh grade. And I have these pictures of John had like taken my bow off my <laughs> head and he had put it on his head. Um, and then, and then he had such huge hands, right? Cause he yeah. was so tall. Yeah. And so there's this, another picture where like my hand was on top of his giant hand. And I remember like saving that picture on my phone and being like, wow, this is so romantic. Like, I was <laughs> touching hands with John Pelham. <laughs> 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 Oh yeah, I mean that guy. He, he was the, the, for every time I saw him interacting with people, he always brought a smile to people's mm-hmm. faces. So mm-hmm. yeah, he's still yeah. missed to this day. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, Laurel, the last thing I would like to interact with you on, because again, uh, you are in the future and I am still in the present, uh, and I'd want to make sure you get a chance <laughs> Thanks, to Japan. <laughs> yeah, Japan. <laughs> Uh, and I want to make sure that you have time to, you know, go on with your Saturday. So uh, mm-hmm. I like to ask two hypothetical questions from this packet of 170. Okay. Uh, so the first question, I immediately, like, I was looking at these over. I was like, uh, this is the perfect one because Laurel's in Japan. So if androids were a thing, how do you think people would treat them? Oh, not the way that they should. Have you seen Bicentennial Man? Have you with also Robin seen Williams? Uh, Westworld? No, I haven't. Ooh. I've seen. Do, have you seen AI with um Haley Joel Osment? And, these are all oh these like gosh, robots. There's so movies. many. Yeah, just no. This is like sincerely something that I thought about. Like, yeah, I don't. I think there would have to be like android rights. Not that the, you know. Yeah. I understand yeah. that they're not sentient beings, but like, I'm still, I'm still kind to my phone, even <laughs> though I know that it, you know. <laughs> and like, whenever I ask Siri or Alexa something, I always say thank you. Like. <laughs> <laughs> everyone else might suck but you're you're treating these mechanical items like i my laptop i love my laptop this camera i love this camera and all this stuff so it's like if androids you come alive you go easy on me yeah they'll be a fan of you <laughs> <laughs> for your tender loving care <laughs> oh, uh, good old tlc the band and also the acronym so <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm one of those glass half full kind of people. Like, I like to think, oh, this this could go well, this could be fine. But then in reality, it's mm-hmm. like, ooh. after you watch Westworld, you'll you'll see what I'm okay. talking about. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the last one uh, I want to ask you because you are very much uh, you're always. I feel like you're always a team player because you're a former athlete. Your mom. Uh, so if you could get every country and every person in the world to work on one project or goal, 
what would it be? Oh, I know. I had to come out of the woodwork with this one. It's not every day I get to talk to someone in Japan, so I had to make mm-hmm. sure make this. Mm-hmm. Good. Yeah. Uh. So just something that's been on my mind lately, because um, like especially since Emma was born, we. So the church that um, I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and our branch here, uh, I help volunteer with the with the teenagers, the young men and young women. And for Christmas, um, they collected a bunch of presents and they made like little kits, like sugar cookie kits and things like that to take to this orphanage in Japan and deliver Mm -hmm. to the children. And just thinking about like kids that don't get to be loved the way that they should, like it just especially since becoming a mom, it's like become so tender to my heart. And like, if I could just bring home all these babies and just love them all day, I would love that. And so I just, (laughs) and I I also think that if you, if you take care of our young is actually part of the family proclamation. I have it on my wall. It's um, a statement put out by my church in like 1995 or something. Uh, And it talks about how families are the most integral part of our social fabric that if you can, if you can help, um, like hold up families and like children being raised with love and to have good values and to be good citizens. I think that honestly would take care of a lot of our world problems if we invested more love in our kids. Oh, Laurel mm-hmm. Barker. Look at that. Got that Running for her. president. <laughs> <laughs> of um, Japan? Home. <laughs> you're gonna be in america i i would i would love yeah. that as president with that proclamation right there Ooh. Uh, I, I don't have an answer because that was just that just blew me away so we're gonna uh, laurel um uh, yeah i'm i'm opting out of answering that one because that's just all right and that one where, where, <laughs> where can the people find you on social media if they want to get closer to your life um, I don't post a ton on Instagram and then my web, my website for my graphic design and my photography is laurelgreengraphics.com. Mm-hmm. But I'll be honest, ever since I got off medication, when I started trying to have a baby that, uh, that has not been updated. So it's like my pre, <laughs> my pre parenthood portfolio. It's been on my to-do list for three years to update my portfolio. And maybe one day we'll get around to it when Emma goes off to school, but <laughs> Laurel Barker, you officially have a podcast episode to your name. How do you yeah. feel about this? How, well, like, I know you're nervous. Or you're just really excited. How, how do you feel now that the journey is over, at least for now? I, I love podcasts, so I was so excited that you asked me to do this. But I know that I'm going to listen to this podcast when it's released and be like, oh, I said so many dumb things. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, as someone that hears himself talk all the, like almost bi-weekly or weekly, uh, mm-hmm. you get used to it. You get used oh. to it. <laughs> You're like, oh, I, I, I said the wrong sentence or like I put the wrong word in the pr- sentence. Ah, screw it. I'm good. <laughs> but it has been a pleasure to be here with you. Thanks so much. It's been fantastic getting to see you again and getting to like hear your story. There's, there, there, there's so many more things I want to ask you, but it's like, you know, we got so much, it's just, uh, just the excitement of just seeing you is just like kind of overpowering mm-hmm. my, you know, comprehensive brain right now. So yeah, podcast round two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Giant thank you to the guests for coming on and telling their story. And thank you to you, the listener or watcher that made it to the end of the episode. And if you like what you heard or watched and will like more episodes from Keone Chats, the show can be found on all podcast platforms and YouTube. If you'd like to stay in the loop in terms of episode releases, again, check us out on KC Media 13 on both Instagram and Twitter and then Conlo K Media on Facebook. If you'd like to be a guest, I'd love to hear your story. Email me at kcmedia13 at yahoo.com. And until the next time, everyone, please take care.